We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the light of the world. You're, you're the one who stepped down into this dark world to bring us the light of life and the light of God. We, we thank you that it's only you that can open eyes. It's only you that can change hearts. It's only you that can create a destiny for us, which is to be with God. So we thank you. And we're completely reliant on you. And we pray that we will be listening to your voice and responding to you by faith. Not just now, but throughout each day. Whatever life brings, knowing that you are always faithful to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We, um, we are now, today, starting a new series, and uh, this series is called Seeking After God's Own Heart. I wonder what uh, you would say on instinct, or what the world, what others might say, uh, a successful life um, includes. Many people would say success is about creating a career uh, and being uh, and, and achieving many things. Other people might say success, um, uh, a successful life is about um, having a good image and being attractive to those around you. But many relationships are the, the key thing in life. And so whether that's a romantic relationship or, or lots of friends, people would say that's what success is. For others, it's comfort and pleasure. But God sees past the temporary and the the things that are, are just in our world in front of our eyes. God sees the long term. God sees the things that matter to him more than just the things that, happen, that matter to man. And so this series, as we think about what it means to seek after God's own heart, we're going to hopefully grow in faith through looking at the life of King David. And uh, King David lived a very colourful life. He was known in Scripture as a man after God's own heart, and yet we know his life wasn't smooth. He suffered the threat of death from both his predecessor, but also from within his own family. We know that he made some calamitous errors and sins which had huge consequences. And yet, Scripture still tells us that he was a man after God's own heart and, and that he achieved the things that God wanted him to achieve in his life. And so we're going to be on a an exploration and an adventure over this year, looking at David's life. And so we're going to split this series into three seasons because there's much uh, content about David's life through Scripture. And so the three seasons, autumn, <laughs> spring, summer, um, will be split up by other things like Advent and Easter. Uh, but much of this year, we're going to be seeking what it means to know how to have a heart like David's towards God. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be encouraging. Um, and uh, today, as a backdrop to this, uh, we're going to be thinking from 1 Samuel 8 uh, about worldly motives and worldly outcomes. We don't actually meet David today, um, but this is a very important foundation uh, for what is to come and to introduce David's life. Uh, so we're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8 uh, through that chapter and then the first couple of verses of uh, chapter 9. And Sarah's going to come and read that for us. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, 
forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. When, the, when Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, Everyone is to go back to his town. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Thank you. Worldly motives are worldly outcomes. I wonder if any of these phrases um, ring true in your experience. I'm sure they do. It'll be quite familiar. Here's the first one. Everybody else is doing it. Yeah? When was the last time you heard that? There's quite a lot of smiles amongst parents here, of course, because that's often the, the, the cry, isn't it, from children that, that want to either play certain video games or watch particular movies or, or go out to places with friends because everybody's doing it. What about this one then? Everyone has one. This is the must-buy. It's the must-have of the season. We know the lure of advertising, don't we, that says, if you don't get this product, you're missing out. We have this whole thing, don't we? Do you know what FOMO is? The fear of missing out. Do you have, ever had FOMO? All oh, have it. Oh, I've missed out on the one thing that everyone else has got. What about this one then? This phrase. Everyone should do it this way. As if there's one particular thing to do in your life that means that if you don't do it this way, you're doing it wrong. It's like a, I put silver bullet up there because we, we sometimes use this idea of a silver bullet, which is the silver bullet is the, the key to, to everything. It's the, it's the quick fire way to success. And if you do this, it's going to work. Everything's going to work. And you know what? It's not just about us as individuals, but churches can fall into that trap, can't they? Churches look around and say, if only we're doing it this way, this is the key to success. Whether that's looking at another church or whether that's taking cues from our culture, our society around us that says, you want to be a successful group? Everybody's doing this. You must. And really, that, those phrases, right? We all know these phrases. Everyone has one. Everyone's doing it. Everyone should do it this way. Um, it builds into this sense of worldliness. I don't know what you think about when, when you have that word worldliness. Um, what, what do you think of? Uh, perhaps you think of a world, worldly approach or worldly person is someone who's pretty streetwise, but a bit underhand, yeah? Quite worldly. Knows how to get things done, but not always honest. Or perhaps worldliness to you is this, uh, this painting a picture of um, carnality, flesh, 
the flesh, as in maybe sexually, sexual desires or giving in to drives. Worldliness also is about short-term gains, isn't it? Forgetting long-term goals, but it's about what's in it for me for now. Not long-term fruitfulness, but short-term wins. That's a worldly approach, isn't it? So worldliness really is about placing such an emphasis on this world, everything that's around me having the answer to success or moving my life forward. So the values of living for myself, living for now, rather than living for God or living for eternity. Kevin DeYoung puts it like this. He says, worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. It's worth thinking about that for us, isn't it? What has become our normal way of thinking? What's our normal response to stuff? And is it in line with God? Or have we become affected or infected by worldly thinking? The Bible, of course, talks about the world. When we think about the world, it talks about the world in different ways. Good to distinguish that. Okay, firstly, um, in God's loving design and creation of the world, God declared all things good. We know that, don't we, when we look at the, the Genesis account of creation. and um, In fact, the word earth in our English Bibles, in my NIV here, earth, um, the physical world, is mentioned 15 times in Genesis 1 and 2. And there was no sense of like a spiritual and physical divide in Genesis. When God made things, all of it that's made by him is created good. So God was pleased with what he had made. The earth and everything in it is good. But a second way that the Bible talks about the world um, comes from the times when people have turned from God, rejected God, and therefore lived our own way. And so the values, the values that people hold are against God's values. Yeah, that's, that's this idea of worldly, being worldly. And so John, in one of his letters, when he talks about the world in that sense, he says this to Christians. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, and he clarifies what he means by that, things like lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, does not come from the Father, but from the world. You can see that, can't we? That's worldly thinking. And yet... With that in mind, we know, because the Bible is very clear, it says God loved the world. I don't know if you can see that very well, but God loved the world so much. Why? Because it's not that God loves the values of worldliness. That's not what it's talking about. God doesn't love that. That's sin. God is holy. But God loves the people of the world. God's love is so strong. And what did he do with that? That love for us is that he sent his only son. That through faith in Jesus we might not be lost forever and perish, but we might have eternal life with him. That's God's love for us. And, And in love, God desires all of us to be saved. And Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And John says in his letter, and as he writes to those believers In his letter, he says, but not just for us, but for the sins of the whole world. The love that God had for the world sent Jesus Christ for us, that we might know him. But as we start our series today, Seeking After God's Own Heart, today's story is a salutary reminder for us that our hearts easily wander and we can become more worldly than godly. Often we exchange the worship of God, our creator, for worshipping things of the world, the things that God's created. It's a second-hand worship, isn't it? We're made for God. God loves us so much. He saved us, and yet he wants our devotion back, and yet so often we can give our praise and our worship to the other things that are to be enjoyed but not to be worshipped. And so what we need, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal what's really in our hearts because we can deceive ourselves. We can say the right things and yet our hearts can still wander away. And so that's where we start today with our story from 1 Samuel chapter 8. What's the background to the story that we've just read, that we're just entering here? The background is this. 
as Israel, God's people, were, sla- um, was, were, were freed from slavery in Egypt, they were brought into a wonderful promised land. God had made that promise to their ancestors and to Abraham, the first promises. And as they inherited the promised land, after their leader Joshua died, uh, the people then um, started looking around. They abandoned their worship for God and, and took on a worship for the gods of the people around them and, and inherited their wicked ways. And so began, began a period known um, in biblical history as the period of the judges. This was a, a period where there was this constant cycle. Don't worry if you can't see all the words up on the screen there. But the idea is this cycle of God's people turning away from him and God allowing them, because of their disobedience uh, and, and disloyalty to him, falling into the hands of their enemies. And as the people repented and turned back to God, um, he raised up a leader for them called a judge who would rescue them from their enemies, bring their hearts back to him, and they would live in peace and prosperity until, not long later, they would turn away. And then the same cycle would happen over and over again. God um, uh, raised up judges over a period of about 400 years. This cycle went on and on and on. And the last of the judges that God raised up was a man called Samuel. In fact, he was a remarkable character because as well as being a judge, um, he was also a priest. A priest was someone that offered prayers and sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And he was also a prophet who received messages from God um, to, to bring to bear on the nation, to pass on the things that were really important to hear and respond to. But here as we enter the story in 1 Samuel chapter 8, this is what happened at the end, uh, towards the end of Samuel's life. Look at your Bibles uh, to see the story as it unfolds. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his, of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Oh dear. Even Samuel's sons that were raised up to be the next leaders were captured by the worldly influences around them. They failed to be the examples that God intended. And so how did the people respond? How did the nation respond to this? What did they desire? What did they want? The answer is that they didn't respond well. And what we have today for us to be really thoughtful about is three uh, characteristics of worldliness that we must uh, pay heed to for our own lives as well. The first is this. Um, It's on your sheets there. You can jot stuff down if you'd like to to do that. Um, The first is this. Worldliness is believing that our culture has the solutions to our problems. See what happens in in the story as the people respond in in, in verse 4 and 5. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now, appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Now, the people may have been right in terms of their assessment about Samuel's sons, yes. But rather than looking up to God to seek the answer to the issue, what did they do? They didn't look up to God, but they looked around them to the other nations to try and work out what they were doing and how they could find their solution from them. They're asking, how do the other nations govern their country? What are they doing that seem to work well? What is success like for the others? How can we learn what the other nations are doing so that we can follow them? It didn't sit right with Samuel. In his spirit, he knew that something was wrong with this request. And what did he do? He prayed to the Lord in verse 6. And the Lord answered him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you that that they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I read that story, my first reaction um, is that, well, maybe the desire for having a king at all was the wrong one. There shouldn't be a king full stop. They had judges, leaders that God raised up, and so that, that asking for a king was wrong in and of itself. But listen to the words that God gave Moses back in Deuteronomy as the people were preparing to enter the land many years before 
and what God told Moses. God said this, When you enter the land the Lord has given you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint a king the Lord your God chooses. You see, back at the time when they were preparing to enter the land, God foresaw a day when actually it would be permissible for the people to to require and have a king to lead over them. But it had to be a man that God chose. It had to be a man that had the credentials that God would institute. And the verses that follow uh, Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 15, verses 16 to 20, actually specify what those credentials were. That a king that God would choose must not be self-seeking by acquiring lots of things for himself, like horses, wives and wealth. He must also be a king who had a desire to follow God's word and would hold it and treasure it and seek to follow it and encourage the nation to follow God through his word. So it wasn't simply the asking of a king in and of itself that was wrong, of the people here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. The problem was that they wanted a king like all the other nations in that they wanted a king with the values that the other nations held. The king himself, having a king himself wasn't the wrong thing, but it was all that went behind it. It was the worldliness and wanting to be like the nations themselves. And here's the thing for us. Just like the nation of Israel saw that one thing was a challenge for them, Samuel's sons were disappointing. How quickly they looked around them at the world and thought, where's my answer? Where's my solution? What is everybody else doing? What does everyone else have? What's the silver bullet to success? That's what they were doing. And how we do that too. Sometimes we're duped, aren't we? Into quickly looking at the world around us and thinking, The answer is, in my culture, what others are doing. When we're lonely, sexual gratification can be an instant fix rather than looking for a a long-term, mutually beneficial relationship. Or too quickly, we, we, we might create a bond with someone because of an attraction rather than actually based on a faith in Jesus that we share together to encourage each other to grow in Christ, someone who has your best spiritual interests at heart. Or maybe when money's tight, what can we do? We can maybe sort of close ranks a bit and we can lose a sense of generosity. We might use our money to to, um, create a happiness for ourselves or so we think, what's going to make me happy? Because money's difficult. Or maybe in our churches. The danger with us in our churches is that we can maybe uh, focus on the wrong things and and churches can be more about trying to entertain people because we want to draw a crowd. We can forget that our focus is calling people to worship, to recognize that God should be the focus. How do we draw our hearts to him? Heart transformation is the key for us in church. It's not about techniques. It's not about worldly uh, motives. It's about heart change. And Timothy Keller, in, in, his, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, talks about idols. And he asks, what is an idol? He says, an idol is anything that is more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll fill my life as meaning. Then I'll know I have value then I'll feel significant and secure. Can you see that? He's not, he's not saying that the things that God has given us to enjoy are wrong, but what he's saying is if someone, something overtakes God and captures our hearts and we say, without this I'm nothing, but with it I am someone, then it becomes an idol for us. And the problem is that idols promise much but deliver little. When we chase our idols, they, give, they seem to... To, to give a, a diminishing um, uh, sense of fulfillment, and we need more of it to try and make us happy. It can't, can't give us what only God can give. But whenever we face a challenge, whenever we have a dilemma, whenever we're walking through life, God, God is the answer to our problems. 
God is the answer to our lives. Our culture cannot supply that. So worldliness is a trap, isn't it? Well, we say our culture gives us the solutions that only God can give. But the second thing I think here, what we see in verse 8, is that worldliness is a pattern that can be built over the long term. Can you see, as God continued to speak to Samuel, he tells him this in verse 8. He says about the people, he says, As they've done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. See, it was new, maybe it was a new thing for Samuel. He'd only lived a short time, not hundreds of years through that process. So, but what Samuel saw in the people's demands, God had been experiencing for many, many years. The, 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 the nation of Israel hadn't just become worldly in their thinking. It was a pattern that had built up. God had rescued the nation from slavery. He called them his treasured possession. His love for them could not be overstated. He blessed them with a wonderful land to live in. He, he said that my, his presence would be with them. They could know God and, and follow him. And yet they were constantly lured by the whispers and the promises of the world, looking around them with a pattern that they built up of choosing the things of the world rather than the things of God and his best. It's true of us too, isn't it? We don't suddenly become worldly. We don't wake up suddenly one day and decide that we're going to listen to other voices. But it can be a pattern that builds up slowly, slowly. Things creep into our lives. And we make choices that, that in the end create the people that we are. C.S. Lewis spoke about this. Um, and this is what he said. He said, every time... Um, every time we make a choice, we're turning the central part of us that chooses into something a little different than it was before. Taking your life as a whole with your innumerable choices, all your life long, you're slowly turning the central thing into either a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. Either into a creature that's in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that's in a state of war and hatred with God and with, other, and with fellow creatures and with itself. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing from one state to another. Can you see the slowly, slowly effect of every choice we make uh, makes us into the person that we're becoming? We don't often see that in ourselves, do we? Because, you know, we live with ourselves. We don't see the changes. And so over a period of time, others might notice differences in us, either godly differences or the opposite, godless differences. And they see it, and eventually it becomes apparent to us. And, you know, sometimes we say, how did this happen when we look at our lives? How, am I, how did I become like this? How did I become a person that's ended up this far from God in this area of my life? Or we might be encouraged by someone that says, hey, I've noticed this godly aspect of your character growing. You say, oh, really? You say, yeah, I can see it. And that's a wonderful encouragement. But the answer, C.S. Lewis says, is, is, is to, to be aware of ourselves, to ask the Spirit to make us aware, and to be intentional about our lives every single day. He goes on to say this. You see the railway track? He'll refer to that in this, this part. He says, This is why little decisions that you and I make every day are of infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or a railway line or bridgehead from which, which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. So don't we must not think that it's only a little thing that we're doing for good or for bad. If we give a bit of ground, yeah, it gives the opportunity for the enemy to create patterns in us. But if we claim a bit of ground for Christ, we allow the spirit of Jesus to affect us and to influence us. This is not in our own strength. 
This is godly choices that Jesus allows us to make. We build up godly patterns. But it's a warning for us that, that, that the nation of Israel built up a worldly pattern of thinking and behaving which brought them to that point of asking for a king with the wrong motives. But what's the third thing that we see about worldliness? What's the third warning that's really important for us today? It's this, that worldly, worldliness never brings us godly outcomes. Paul, in his, in his letter to the Galatians, um, tells them this. He says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And we can be so contradictory, can't we, sometimes? We, we come on a Sunday and we sing our songs, and we have our spiritual conversations. And yet by Monday, we can be making choices, or having thoughts, living lives that we'd be embarrassed for our friends at church to know about. The thing is, the Bible tells us very clearly that the things that we invest in will bring outcomes consistent with the values of that investment. Yeah? Yeah? You can't get out of something what it cannot give you. And so worldly investments will bring out worldly outcomes. Israel themselves might have been proud to be known as God's people, but their worldly choice of a king would not bring them godly blessings. That was the problem. And so when, when God continued to talk with Samuel about this, this, this demand that the people made, this is what God said to him. He said, now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. There's the warning straight away. What type, what, what, this type of king, what will he do? And the answer is, he will take. He will take and he will take. Just look at the explanation there through those verses. Um, it says, that he will take your sons, in verse 11, to make his army successful. Um, he will take your daughters, verse 13, to make his life comfortable. They will do jobs to serve him, make his life better. He will take your fields and your crops, your servants, your flocks, verses 14 to 17, to make his life more prosperous. Can you see? A king like this will take from you. He will take from you. He will take in order to please himself rather than give in order to serve the nation. And so a king like this will end up making the nation less than what they were rather than more. Well, that's the warning. Can you see the contrast between a king like that and God who becomes our Father in Jesus Christ, the character of God who is a giver, in his love, we've already said this today, God gave his only son. You see the generosity, the lavish generosity of God, the creator of the world who could do anything he likes. But he gave his only son for us to bring us back to him by his grace. Jesus, when he came to, into the world Jesus is the only true king, the, the mighty king that's ever lived. And yet he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Love gives. And God is love. He is the greatest giver. And so in Christ, he has given us. He's given us a new chance for life. New hope through the cross, through his rising. And so as we turn to Jesus, we encourage you, turn to Jesus for new life. And as you trust in Jesus as your king, then you will always be more than what you were. More. When we think about earthly kings, we've already noticed that it's not necessarily wrong to have an earthly king, but what type of king should we desire? We should certainly be praying for our king, uh, Charles to be led in his leadership by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This week, uh, the 8th of September, is the one-year anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth. 
how that year has gone, eh? And Charles was hugely influenced by his mother and, and the faith in Jesus that she had. In fact, this time last year as she died, this is what he said. He said, Queen Elizabeth's life was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service, I renew to you all today. He promised a year ago that he would serve our country. And our prayers for him should certainly include him staying close to Jesus Christ, trusting in Jesus as, as the king, that he would lead our country with humility and service and being a giver, not a taker. Well, we come back to this story in 1 Samuel and we see that information and education in itself doesn't change people. There's a bit of a myth, isn't there, that, and, and sometimes it's espoused in our, in our culture that the more information and education you give people, the better off they'll be. You know, I'm not disputing education is valuable. But without heart change, the things that we really need to respond to will be met with deaf ears. And it was true in the case of the people that Samuel warned. Despite his warnings about the type of king they were asking for, Israel emphasized, we want a king over us. Then we should, be, we should be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. And so at that point, God gave them over to their desires. Sometimes God does that. He gives people over to their desires and allows the situation to play out. Do you know, sometimes if God doesn't give you what you want, it can be a blessing. It can be a blessing. Because sometimes if we're asking for the wrong things, or if there's things we don't see or don't know, God may not give us that because he's actually being merciful to us. But sometimes he gives people over two desires. And then the truth plays out. Here, what happened? We see at the beginning of chapter 9. There was a man called Kish who had a son named Saul. As handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. Wow, he was the perfect choice. This is the type of king they wanted. Strong man. A man with stature. A man that would lead them in battle. He was anointed king. And how would that play out? Well, in the short term, things looked promising. There were some early battles, some early victories, as the Spirit of God actually helped Saul in those fights. But a while later, he, his true colors played out. It showed that his heart for God wasn't desiring after God, and he disobeyed God's instructions at a particular point, or brought a stinging rebuke from Samuel. And here are some of the words of Samuel to Saul. When we'll see Saul over, over the next few weeks, as we see that interaction between him and David. But this is what Samuel said to Saul. He said, you have not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you in his disobedience. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought after a man sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. God knew all along that David was the one that he would choose and next week we'll see the way that God chooses, certainly not the way that the people of Israel chose. So what do we have to learn today? We have to have our eyes open to what worldliness looks like. We need to ask the Spirit to show us that worldliness deceives us by saying that the culture around us has the solution to our problems. Worldliness can be built up as a pattern over a long period. Decisions that we make matter. And that worldliness will not bring us godly outcomes. Only Christ will. And so let's pray Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for ourselves. Let's look to put Jesus at the center of everything we do here and that we might have hearts that desire and seek after God in everything that we do. Now let's pray and begin to ask him for that.
Lord, the truth is that that proper blessings in our lives only come when we seek you. And Jesus said it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added. We, uh, we confess, Father, that we, we are quick to be lured by desires and whispers of the world, things that seem to attract us and yet they disappoint or they fade. Not the answer. And we pray that you'd forgive us as individuals, as a church, for those times that we've fallen into those traps. And we pray for protection. We pray for your mercy over us that we wouldn't build up patterns and habits that cause us to go down the wrong track or to become people that do not resemble what it means to be a Christian. Lord, it has to start in our hearts and we pray. The start of this year, the start of this term, this new season, whatever's happening in our lives right now, that you might create in us those hearts that are desiring of you above all else. Lord, please speak to us. Please shape us. And please allow us to be receptive to you and to help each other along that, that journey and that path to godliness. In Jesus' name, amen.